Shalom, shalom, and welcome to the live broadcast of the Wednesday evening Bible study of Betaria Congregation. I always look forward to be sitting in this chair in front of this iPad to be able to, to share with you his wonderful word and be sanctified by his Ruach HaKodesh. Uh, you know, people ask me how many iPads do I have for they say they see different ones. I just have two actually, one for teaching and one for reading. In fact, I rarely read uh, paper books like those I have behind me, except rabbinical books that I, can't, uh, that I can only find in paper format. So I find it much easier to read and make notes with my iPad. Now, as we're going through our study on the doctrine of redemption in the Torah, today we're going to go directly to our subject of tonight, uh, I, I wanted to spend the time we have in this great book of Leviticus, Leviticus and the message of the redemption that is contained in this book and how the Messiah is so well portrayed in this book. During the study, uh, in fact, if you have any comments or questions, and if you're watching through YouTube or Facebook, write your question or on the comment section or write us at info at betariel.ca. I remember once uh, driving home with my son Ilan uh, when he was very young, of course, and I told him that I was about to start a new study on the book of Leviticus. All surprise, he said to me, aren't the laws of this book obsolete? It is true that at first glance, what might, might wonder what a believer would today do with all these sacrifices and all these hundreds of commandments concerning the Levites and concerning the temple. The first thing you see as you open the book, by the way, it's as if blood comes out from everywhere. It is a very detailed and graphic description of how animals and how many animals were to be sacrificed. And once you finish reading the first seven chapters, the first section, you are then confronted with so many minute details concerning the Levitical priesthood. And to top this off, laws concerning leprosy. When was the last time in your life did you meet a, a leper? Furthermore, the style in which the book was written does not facilitate our understanding of these laws. It is one of the most complicated book to study. One writer said that all these sacrif sacrificial laws defy comprehensive analysis. The burnt offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the meal offering, the peace offering, and, and the English translation do not make it easier as they give different titles for the same sacrifice. What the New American Standard Bible says on Leviticus 7.1 when it speaks of the guilt offering, the New King James speaks of the trespass offering. When the New King James speaks of the heave offering, the New American Standard speaks of the contribution offering. And elsewhere, it speaks of simply an offering. This doesn't help. However, however, let me begin by giving you a good reason why we should study this book, and not just once, but over and over again. Of all the books of the Bible, this one, Leviticus, contains more of the very words of God than any of the other books. Here, in most, uh, almost every page, God is the direct speaker. We are then approaching a very, very solemn book of the Bible, a book which we can call the Holy of Holies of the Scriptures. And here is the Holy of Holies of the Torah. Even Moses, even Moses in the book of Leviticus is seen from a different perspective from wh what we know of him from the other four books of the Torah. For example, in the previous book, Exodus, we meet a Moses whose strong personality seemed to rule the events. But here throughout the book of Leviticus, he takes the back seat. His words and actions are all in response to what God, the Lord, told him to do. Here in Leviticus, we see a Moses who's in awe. In awe rather than reacting or having his off, often back and forth conversation with the Lord. Here he simply follows through with the commandments. Almost as if these laws were so awesome, he is so overwhelmed by the presence of God that, that he humbly received these words with a quiet and obedient spirit. Many times we read, the Lord spoke to Moses, the Lord commanded Moses, and then we read the words, Moses took, Moses brought. So Moses did as the Lord commanded. And the sad situation is that this book may be the least read of all the 66 books we have in the scriptures, yet God speaks the most in there. But it is here where God is so 
present. It is here where he speaks to us. Uh, it, is this not a side dichotomy? As believers in the word of God, we, we ought to seek to know more of what God is revealing to us in this great book and why he chose such words, images, and types to speak to us today. It is like one who, who travels through the, the thickest part of a jungle and finally, when you see some light, finally arrives at a clearing where the sun rays make alive and visible the many gems lying everywhere. Le let me tell you that the book of Leviticus is, and I might say, I might say, the most Christian of all the Old Testament books. And nowhere else is the work of the Messiah so well typified. Jesus is there. Yeshua is at every corner there. The life of Yeshua is so well depicted in, th in those many sacrifices. And nowhere else is the doctrine of holiness so well brought out. Not only the holiness of the Messiah, but, but the level of holiness that is required for each one of us. The book of Leviticus is like a picture that we stare out, a picture that might deeply actually offend us. Why? Because it is not merely a, a picture that we can view with impartiality and detachment. It is instead, instead a mirror of one owns heart, of one owns condition of heart. Because as one studies this book, one thing which really stands out is our necessity of a growing sanctification and how this sanctification is important to God. The book of Leviticus is a monitor and a gauge of our lives as believers. This book, when read and studied under the Spirit's conviction and direction, will bring the reader to take very seriously God's word concerning his judgment and the end times to come as well. Leviticus, again, is the gospel, the good news of the Old Testament. At this point in time, we'll not be going a verse-by-verse verse study of this book, but we, we will look at four distinct sections, okay, in, which bring out the necessity of the Messiah, the need of his death and resurrection, without which, without which there's no way to approach God, without which with, uh, there's no everlasting life with God, without which all men are lost. And to quote Daniel's uninspired words, which are no, might be shocking to some, we read that without the Messiah, there's only one consequence. And that, by the way, is in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. It says either with God, but if we don't know God, that consequence, of course, is shame and everlasting contempt. This is how he says it, Daniel 12, 2, as you have it in the screen. And so I will begin with that one powerful verse, which clearly states that the blood, it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. You must know this passage, Leviticus 17, 11. After that, we'll go back to chapter 1 and, and see the importance of each sacrifice and discover why they were necessary, not only to enter the presence of God, but to maintain a relationship with God. And we're going to see how the person himself okay, killed the animal and cut the animal and took out the entrails and so on. We will then take a closer look at Leviticus 13, 14, coupled with Yeshua first miracle performed in Matthew that is the healing of leprosy. Chapter 13, 14 speaks of this leprosy and then from there we're going to understand the words and action of Jesus in the book of Matthew chapter 8. From there, we'll look at chapter 16 and try to figure out the mystery of the two goats and who is Azazel. It is my prayer that these four sections will help us to really see the need of the Messiah in our lives today and also for eternity. Let us begin with this so important verse of Leviticus 17.11. This is what it says. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. If there's one verse in Leviticus which sums up its message of redemption, this is the one. Notice in this verse how the word atonement is mentioned two times, twice. It is translated into the English word covering so that it might have a greater impact on us. And, and notice as well that the word life is used also three times, this time three times. Life, eternal life, salvation is possible only through the covering of atonement. These words were so carefully chosen to help us understand that eternal life 
is possible only through the shedding of blood and the application of that atonement for our souls. Of course, through the progressive revelation of the Word of God, as I, we, we will see how only Yeshua fit the requirement of this atonement and, and these so stern laws that we have here. It is then the blood that makes atonement for the soul. This verse explains why God took the life of the animals to make skins for Adam and Eve when they had sinned, if you remember. The necessity of blood is explained here in Leviticus 17.11 and this was fulfilled by the death again of the Messiah. You can see in the screen a brief development of the redemption in the Tanakh so far. From Genesis 3.21 where we see God's action of covering Adam and Eve with animal skins. You know, this verse comes after the first messianic prophecies of Genesis 3.15. And so he puts it into action. And the action is explained here in Leviticus 11, which says that it is the blood that makes atonement for the sins. And since anim animal bloods, we all know that, since animal blood cannot save but serve only as a temporary covering, we see the fulfillment of this symbolic action on the tab, on the cross, in the prophecy of the Messiah in Isaiah 53, 5, which says, by his straps we are healed. And furthermore, concerning the word kapar, atonement, an important word in Leviticus, do you know when was the last time the last time we find it. By the way, the first time is in here in Leviticus. The last time that is used in the Hebrew scriptures is with Daniel when he expounded on the first coming of the Messiah. This is found in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. A prophecy, by the way, many in the first century understood to be related to the Messiah's coming and they were waiting for the Messiah because Daniel gave a date here. But see how the prophecy opens up. Verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So then, where is the word atonement in here? By the way, what Daniel says is that in 70 weeks, 70 weeks, that is 490 years, weeks of years, it, the Messiah actually will establish all these things, right? By the way, there's seven years left. These are the time of tribulation, okay? But the time before, it's exactly when the Messiah came and fulfilled all these things, right? So when was the word atonement to be found? It is found in the Hebrew word reconciliation. The word is kapar, kapar. Daniel the prophet was given such a great revelation here which points to the one who would fulfill all the various types of atonement we find in the book of Leviticus. From Leviticus to Daniel. Okay, this is where the covering actually is explained to us. In fact, in this passage, Daniel goes as far as to name the Messiah by the word Messiah. Look at the next verse, 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until when? Messiah, Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and so on. Daniel gives us a, a, an in-depth description of him. He, he even tells us that this anointed one will die. That he will be that final pitch. The final atonement for us, verse 26, it says, And after 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off. Cut off means to die, to die. Daniel 9, 24 to 26 is the best commentary of the book of Leviticus where we see sin covered or atoned for only by the Messiah. And furthermore, we are clearly told in the book of Hebrews, when you go to the New Testament, look what it says, verses 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with the, his own blood. He, Yeshua, the Messiah, entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. This is why there's no temple today, or need for one today, or at least for the last 2,000 years. Where then is the redemption coming from? The crucial verse of Leviticus 17.11 asks each one of us the question, where is your blood? Where is the sacrifice? Who is your sacrifice? Surely not yourself, not ourselves. We are sinners. That's what the Bible says. Nowhere else is this redemption found in, but in Yeshua HaMashiach, who is now sitting at the right hand of God and with his arm opened 
for anyone who would want to come to him. And notice that it is in this book, Leviticus, where th though the Lord speaks the most, he always speaks through a mediator, through a mediator. Let, let, let's see the presence of, of this mediator right from the first couple of verses in Leviticus. Let's read again verse 1. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, verse 2, Speak to the children of Israel. You speak to the children of Israel. As the Lord came and dwelt with men in the tabernacle, he does not address Israel directly, but chose to speak through a mediator instead. This is where we're going to see later on that Moses is a type of the Messiah as well. And the Bible teaches in Hebrews 12, 24, that this mediator in Leviticus typified the Messiah, Yeshua. He is the mediator, it says, of the new covenant. Once this truth is established, right at the entrance into this book, we further read that God spoke from one particular place. He spoke to Moses from the tabernacle of meeting, and he always did through, throughout this book, by the way. And, and the point is that the path to God is to be found not in every which way somebody decides, but in the one way God prescribes in the scriptures. That is through his son, as Yeshua said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And once these important truths are, are set for us, it is now that we come when the book completely turns toward man and his condition. Let us try to imagine the scene at the temple. Okay, this is in Leviticus chapter 1. Here we can picture a man lining up with all the others in front of the door of the tabernacle. And next to each one of them, okay, is an animal to sacrifice for his own sin. Showing that each of these individuals understood that they had transgressed the law of, the God, of God. So God says, you sin, come and gave your sacrifice. These sacrifices were not there to tell them that they were sinners. The conviction of the Holy Spirit would do that job. But the sacrifices were there first to, to, to make them realize the awfulness of sin. Because we're going to see what they're going to do with these animals. Second, to show them how sinful they were themselves. And third, that this was the way they were to be reconciled to God through the blood. Yes, there are some unchanged prerequisites before someone is able to come in the presence of God. One prerequisite is that the individual must first realize what helpless condition he is in. Otherwise, he has no place lining up before the tabernacle of God or even demanding to see God. And this, in this portion of Leviticus, God does not go easy, by the way doesn't go easy. We, we now come to a very harsh portion of the book where we're giving details of the sacrifices, such as how the animals were to be killed, to be cut in pieces, and how the blood was to be sprinkled, and how the entrails were to be taken out, and so on. But why do we need this? With every cut of the animal, it should be cut us, it should cut us to the heart, letting us realize the real condition of our sin. This is the reason. Once again, as repulsive as these descriptions are, as we're going to read, so is the real nature of sin. That's the message of this chapter 1. The word that we find in the book of Galatians 3.19, that you find in your screen, really sums up for us the detailed description of these sacrifices before. I want to give you that verse before we read these sacrifices. See what it says. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. What does that mean? It was added before because of transgressions. It means that if there was no sin, there would be no need for laws or especially these laws of sacrificing innocent animals. And since sin is present, then this is how much the law is needed. The two are co-related. So harsh as the law may be, it just serves to demonstrate how grief the sin is in God's eyes. But Galatians 3.19, by the way, does not stop at the word transgression. It doesn't, and praise God for this. As the book of Leviticus does, by the way. It brings out the whole truth about sin and salvation. See the rest of the, of the verse. W I'll read the whole verse. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgression. Still the seed, the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of the mediator. 
So the Mosaic law was added as a training ground for Israel. So it was for the individual to recognize his sin until where? Until the seed, the seed of the woman from Genesis 3.15 came to fulfill it, meaning took all the judgments of the law into himself. By the way, this doesn't mean that there's no law anymore for believers, right? The, the, you're right. The, the law of the Lord existed before, parallel to, and after the Mosaic law. The law we are now under is the law of the Messiah spoken in the New Testament and incorporating the Mosaic law without judgment. Now let's now go to the text of Leviticus and see the procedure of the sacrifice of the burnt offering. Leviticus 1, let's begin with verse 3 and read through 6. I will ask Sharon to read it, to read this part for us. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bull before the Lord. And the priests, Aaron's sons, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all over the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into its pieces. This is the word of God. Now notice first how the person in verse 4 puts his hands on the head of the animal Okay, before it is sacrificed before he actually sacrifices it, okay? In order to transfer, symbolically transfer his sin, uh, and we're told that after that, he kills the bull, okay? So there's a transfer of sin, right? In the same way, when you accept the Lord Yeshua as your personal Savior, there's a transfer of your own sins that he took upon his own body on the tab. And that, I want to tell you, verse 4 is quite significant. What it says is that the prerequisite for acceptance of the sacrifice is that the hand of the sinner be upon the head of the offering. That implies that the sinner understands, that the sinner understood that the death and the blood of the animal was a covering for his own sins. Now, again, imagine the sin. The person approaches the tabernacle. He's confronted with a long line of people holding on their unblemished animals. And this line stops at the door where this huge burning altar, if you remember the, the size of it, right, was surely visible from where they were and where each of these animals were killed, skinned and cut to pieces. Have you ever seen a bull? Or, or, or a cow, for instance. C can, you, can you picture yourself killing it and skinning it and cutting it to pieces? Again, as the individual stands in line with the animal, as he approaches the altar where, 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 where he, 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 his turn will come, he surely will begin to notice these rivers of blood flowing from the altar and the priest's garments drenched in blood and the sandals soak it with blood, right? Perhaps after looking at the whole scene, his eyes will be drawn back toward the innocent animal that he brought along with him and he will look with great pity he will look at it and feel very sorry for it because he will realize that because of his own sins, this animal is going to be sacrificed. This, I believe, is the point here. While our tendency is to minimize and normalize sin, Leviticus is here to tell us otherwise. And see now how the animal was to be cut. Okay, now let's go to verse 12 and, and, and read 12 and 13. I'll ask Sharon to do that for us. And he shall cut it into pieces with its head and its fat, and the priests shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash the entrails and the legs with water. Then the priest shall bring it all and burn it on the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And he shall cut it into pieces. But who actually is doing the sacrifice? You know, I, I want to tell you, it's not very clear who sacrifices the bull, but both the priest and the person were there together. And it is believed that the person himself kills it. And the priest was standing next to him. This is how Ibn Ezra, for instance, understood the original text. Just imagine the scene. And if it was a bird, because the person was too poor, if it was too poor to buy a bull or a smaller animal, he had to bring a bird. And you know how 
the bird was to be sacrificed. Let, let's read verses 14 to 15. I'll ask Sharon to do this for us. And if the burnt sacrifice of his offering to the Lord is of birds, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or young pigeons. The priest shall bring it to the altar, wring off its head, and burn it on the altar. Its blood shall be drained out at the side of the altar. So in this case, the priest will take the bird in his hand, and his head will be in between his thumb and his index, and he will crush its head, and the blood will come out of its mouth. I want to tell you all through this, the Lord wanted the sinner of the time and us today because this is the word of God and us today to witness the gravity of our sin and realize that all these laws were added because of our transgression. Through this God wanted the offender to be repulsed by his own actions and trigger the death by triggering the death of the animal and in so doing he will see the holiness of God behind this demand. Hopefully Hopefully, that, that would have discouraged the people to come back to the temple. In fact, I believe that that was the point of it all. God did not want to see them again because of their sins. But all of these, these things speak of the Messiah, of course. When you read all these things, when you read these demands, don't you want to run to Yeshua? All of these things speaks of the Messiah in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Because Hebrews and Leviticus are, are twin books, so to speak. And there is one passage in, in the Hebrew scriptures that, are, that, that is quoted where we see the Messiah coming and taking the place of the animal. This is in Hebrews 10.5, which quotes actually Psalm 40. We're going to close with this. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 to 7. Sharon will read it for us. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Therefore, when he came into the world, this is Yeshua. This is Yeshua. Yes, Yeshua came into a body prepared by God the Father. One that is like ours, so that he could die and show his perfect power over death with the resurrection that we can, so that we can have eternal life. This is the Messiah speaking who says that in all of these sacrifices that we see in Leviticus and elsewhere, God did not really take pleasure in them. And so he comes down to dwell in a body so he can fulfill the demands of the law so we may be saved. But I want, I want you to see the original uh, quote from Psalm 40. And here we will see something truly beautiful about the work of the Messiah. Verses 6 and 7. Shan will read it for us. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have pierced. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. Instead of a body you have prepared for, you have prepared myself. The Messiah came and said of all the sacrifices, but here is my ears you have pierced, it says. Okay. Why, why, what does that mean? How can we understand that his ears were pierced? You know, there's one passage in the Torah which speaks of a servant who, after serving for a period of seven years, he decides then to dedicate the rest of his life to his master. And how, how is this done? It is done as we read in Exodus 21, 6. And there it says, Then his master shall bring him to the judges and shall also bring him to the door or the doorpost. And his master shall, what? Pierce his ear with an awl and he shall serve him forever. The piercing of the ear was used to stamp the servants for the life of the servant. Here the servant fully dedicates his life to serve in the same way that Yeshua, who is the servant of the Hebrew scriptures, the servant of Jeho Jehovah, speaks and he says, Behold, I come, a body you have prepared for me. And here we see the incarnation of the, the virtuous and unparalleled faithfulness of the true servant, the ultimate servant of Jehovah who is described in Isaiah 53, 11, my righteous servant, it says, shall justify many. 
Amen and amen. This is all the time we have for this evening. We'll keep on next week and we'll go into deeper into the book of Leviticus, which brings out so well the, 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 the work and the person and the ministry of the Messiah. May the Lord bless you. Amen and amen.